Olá a todos, muito boa tarde. Bem-vindos à semana de inovação na Universidade de São Paulo com Airbus e Unesco. É, gostaria de receber a todos com esta palestra que a gente vai ter sobre o futuro, o que, que a gente pode imaginar no futuro em termos de, de aviação. Né? E ao longo dessa semana a gente vai ter outras atividades é, na, na FAO, na curso de arquitetura e design. E, e hoje a gente está recebendo o Gary e Gregor, e que vieram falar para a gente um pouquinho sobre esta ideia de, de futuro, como que a gente pode imaginar, né, como que a gente pode pensar o que, que seria esse futuro que não está muito distante. Então, eu gostaria de agradecer em nome do Departamento de Engenharia de Produção da Escola Politécnica, a Airbus, o Gary, o Gregor, a Unesco, o pessoal que veio dar um, um apoio para o evento. E espero que todos aproveitem bem essa, essa palestra, que é a primeira atividade da semana. Gostaria também de cumprimentar o pessoal que nos acompanha, a todos que nos acompanham por internet. Então, muito obrigado a todos e eu passo a palavra aos nossos palestrantes. Obrigado. Obrigado, Fausto. Sim, obrigado, Fausto. Eu entendi que você disse meu nome duas vezes. But I didn't understand a word apart from that, so forgive us, we'll do this in English. We do this in English because we don't speak Portuguese, obviously, but we also do it because we have people online. Uh, what you see here, Gary, me, and the screen is streamed um, on Google Hangouts, and you can even have a look after it uh, on the website later on. Thanks for coming. Uh, we are very pleased to be here, and just to make sure that Fausto said the right things, I'll repeat. Innovate with us. Um, we are here because a team from your university has been winning the Flyer Ideas contest last year, 2013. And the Flyer Ideas con contest is uh, organized by Airbus, the company we come from, and is sponsored by UNESCO. We have Romani with us, uh, who will animate one of the workshops in the course of the week and will be around for the, for the other events in the week. Today, I fear she has no role to play. but. Um, You have to bear with us for the moment. So, let me say something. Gary wants to say let something. something. We've got a big sign over there. Innovate with us. I'm wondering if anybody is wondering what us or who us is. But I'd like you to consider for this week, we are privileged to be in Sao Paulo. The us works on three levels. There is us, Gregor and Gary. We are here for the week. We would love to meet you, to interact with you, have discussions. So we'd like you to innovate and discuss with us two people. But we also represent Airbus, and we're here to discuss also innovating with and in conjunction with Airbus. But where we're going to start today is something beyond that. We're going to talk about something we are both passionate about, something a career that has given us uh, 25 years of exceptional experiences. And that's about innovating for commercial aviation. So the rest of the week is about perhaps working with Airbus or um, innovating with Airbus. It's about innovating with the two of us. Today is about uh, us asking you, trying to encourage you to come and innovate with aviation. We understand that there is a great challenge, a big demand on talented people in this world by many different industries, many sectors, many uh, great societal challenges. We're here to make a case, we hope, for you to take an interest in something we are passionate about. And maybe by the end of this afternoon, we will uh, see if we can share some of that passion with you. For this afternoon, you're going to see some slides and a video. But we'd like to interact. In fact, we want to interact with you today. So a little bit later, we're going to try and pose some questions to you. And don't be shy. Feel free to challenge us. What we say, what we will present, is what we believe, we think we believe, doesn't make it true. What we're interested to in understand or find out is what you think, what beliefs you have, what feelings do you have, and let you feed back to us. So do not be shy to challenge us and to say, I don't agree, or I do agree, or it may be different. And let's hope in uh, about a 
45 an hour from now, we'll have that uh, real interaction. Thanks, Greg. So wherever you do disagree, please let us know. We'll ask you questions all the time, but there are lots of opportunities throughout the week to tell us what's wrong with what we've been showing here. We are happy to, to learn if we're wrong. It's not about being annoyed by hearing that something didn't please you. No, it's about learning what is wrong, if there is anything wrong. Maybe there is not too much wrong, but in any case, we want to know the truth. So don't be shy on that one. So let me just start with a couple of slides to introduce aviation to those who are not fully familiar with what that is about and why innovation, as Gary said, feels so attractive to at least the two of us and hopefully for you at some point in time. So within 60 seconds, a lot is happening in the world and particularly in aviation, big things are happening within just 60 seconds. So just to take a couple of these figures, Roughly every second, one airplane is taking off somewhere in the world. Half of that happens to be an Airbus airplane, but we talk about the commercial airplane type of things. Something like one a second. Pretty impressive. We've got something like 16,000 airplanes flying, and they all together, in one minute, make something like 17,000 or a little bit more kilometers of distance, twice around the globe. We have, every minute, something like 2,000 meals to be eaten on the airplanes, um, cooked, well, if you call that cooking, uh, delivered, distributed by the stewardesses, 2,000 per minute. That's quite a high number. So if you do this all day, all week, all month, the whole year, you add up real big figures of things. So in a year, we move a little bit above 2.5 billion passengers more than one-third of the world population is taking an airplane at least once a year. The world depends on this exchange in the way we live in the world today. 15 million jobs uh, happen to be directly dependent of the aviation industry. And that's not the tourism type of thing where, well, if nobody flies in, they don't have a hotel running. It's the people who are working in our industry, in our supply chain, with us on a daily basis. 15 million. And that all together comes up with more than one trillion, whatever a trillion is, US dollar of um, gross domestic, domestic product per year. That's a tremendous thing. We move the world, and without us, the world would look a little bit different. We are proud of this, and we, we hope to share a little bit of this with you. Now, that's when we fly. But sometimes we can't fly. You probably remember in 2010, there was a big volcano incident and for a little bit more than a week we were not able to fly throughout Europe and it had lots of distractions in the rest of the world. The first week of that basically shutdown of flying, two and a half billion US dollars were lost within our industry with the airlines, with the aviation uh, partners who make things happening. Another half billion of revenues were blocked because the workers who wanted to go somewhere to do their work couldn't fly there or couldn't go back home and do their work. They were just stranded somewhere without being able to work. Half a billion lost in a week. But there is far more behind that because if they can't work, they can't supply things. Um, the automotive industry got struck down at the time. So finally, it was something like five billion US dollars lost within one week where the air traffic system broke down. You don't want to risk that. We, we definitely want to be able to fly throughout the year and avoid that type of disruption to the world economy. That's one of the reasons why taking a risk in, I'm not talking about safety, but in terms of economic losses or um, destruction uh, is a no-go in our industry. We don't want to take risk. We want to make it happen. We want to be continuously doing things the way they are. In the very beginning, some 100 years ago, that's from um, 1914, obviously, uh, flying was all about being able to fly at all. It was about the machines, the miracle of building these machines and the hero pilots who, who got it all together. This is the first officially recognized commercial flight. Uh, commercial is one passenger in that case uh, and he paid, they say, it was a journalist. Um, but we've developed things a little bit from then. And in particular, we don't need the heroes in the business, we have an organization. It's all well regulated and well running and uh, well making the economic impact we've been talking about. 
we're not just doing individual flights, we spend the world. Um, we fly to all places. You see the, the, the red little dots, which are um, infrastructure things, and you see the green lights, which are flight routes, which are operated day by day. That's the world. There is not many areas where you can't fly to. Uh, it's called the real World Wide Web. Anybody got an idea who said that? It was Bill Gates who reflected on the internet when he was late with it, actually. And he said, well, there is already a real World Wide Web, which is aviation. Now, we touch the world, but the world touches back. All the worries which are down on Earth impact this organism of aviation. We are not free from that. We cannot escape. We've got social, political, economic regulatory and uh, technical is issues which need to be solved and brought into synchronization in order to make that happen on a day-by-day -day basis. It's a very complex system of systems, actually. And that all needs to work together in a smooth and um, barrierless way. Unfortunately, the world isn't exactly barrierless. All what we've said, all the different uh, regulation, the different societal needs and stuff, is also split in all the nations of the world. So if you want to do the global, worldwide aviation, you've got to bring that all under one umbrella and them worldwide. That's a real big challenge. It really requires a special way of doing things and a lot of knowledge about how things are done throughout the system, which is the world. That makes aviation so complex. We've got to do it for the whole world. Now, the countries are all, as you know, independent, but we do have quite a number of transnational organizations which help to organize things. This is a small number of them, Federal Aviation Administration or the IATA, which is the passenger, uh, the um, commercial, what's the IATA um, abbreviation for International yeah, Aviation Transport, Transport um, Association. So that's the ones who take care of the airline uh, and uh, flight operations continuity throughout the world. We've got the World Trade Organization and we've got the United Nations and well, for some reason we've got the UNESCO sponsorship as well. So we've got these worldwide governing organizations on board to some extent, but you can imagine it takes quite some time to get them all moving. Another part of that uh, business is the airport, the ground infrastructure we need. We've got the flying machines, the pilots, the airlines, blah, 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 but we also got the airports. And where do you think the airports do make the most money from? Anybody got an idea how an airport business is run? Well, we've written car park, that was an easy one. Mm -hmm. um, actually, the most money is done by the, the car park. The second much is the shopping mall, the renting of the shops, of the luxury shops uh, you see in the airports. And the third one is the landing fees, the airside operation of aviation. So the airports have a business which is not much related to flying. They have to do it, they have to provide it, but actually shopping mall, parking lot is what they do. So they have a quite a different interest than the airlines, and certainly quite a different interest in things than we have. Furthermore, regions depend on air traffic. If nobody is flying into the areas, uh, they can't do commerce. So they do pay some airlines to fly to some airports. Ryanair is one of those examples uh, who actually get paid by regions to fly to a certain airport somewhere in Europe. That's a, quite an interesting business case here, and uh, we must not forget that there's regional, national, international, industrial, sector-wise interest in all we are doing. Need a break? Good. Need a break. <laughs> so, 100 years, we've seen in the last few slides, the industry has come from a flying boat with one passenger to a truly global industry with a global reach and a global benefit. Yeah, it's very big. We're not the only big industry or the big part of the world, but it is very big. What makes it quite special is the complexity. Big and complex are not necessarily the same thing. It's the number of interacting parties and players and people you have to align to get anything done. We pride ourselves in our industry, not just Airbus, but every player. Ember, the same, Boeing, the Bombardier, any player body is a player. What is at the core of our industry is the ability to organize. We bring order. The whole of the air transport industry has been designed to bring order. We know what's flying. 
every single event, every moment of every day, and every single operation on board the aircraft is predictable. It's the basis of certification. So we know everything about everything all the time. Highly ordered, highly structured. Because it's highly ordered, highly structured, that actually works against innovation. It can help to get things done, as I'll show you in a moment. But it also works against innovation. Now we'll take an exception. Is one of the, the great things about our industry is the ability for the industry itself to react to bad things. And this has gone throughout the whole 100 years of history of aviation. We don't like to think about the negatives in the business, but it drives who we are. And in certain circumstances, our industry can respond just about like nobody else to an incident, to a situation. That's when we can mobilize huge energy and effort across the globe. This is not just Airbus. It's not just one nation, not just one company. It's a collective. Every airline, every manufacturer, every authority can respond and react very quickly. Not many people can do that. What we need to be able to do is to get some form of reactive new response in, in the good things when we don't need to, when we're not up against it. And that's one of the big challenges for us. Because many of the needs we will see, they're beyond one company. Airbus is a big company, Boeing's a big company, Embraer is a big company. These go beyond one company. They go beyond one industry. They go beyond one country. So how on earth are we going to get that collective effort we need to sustain our industry and sustain what we believe society needs? This is one way of doing it. But first of all, can somebody give me the name of an innovator? If I say, who is an innovator? Can you give me a name of somebody? Anybody? Anybody know any innovators? Living or dead? No? OK. Anybody else? Yeah? Normally, when you talk about innovator, people will give you single names. From, uh, from our part of the world, everybody knows Jobs because of the movie, because of the book, because of Apple. It's one person. The reality is it's not one person. It's a huge number of people who all ha happen to make things happen. <coughs> was John Kennedy the innovator? No, he was the guy who, who created the right conditions for innovation to take place. Probably, probably one of the biggest man, uh, uh, well, mission of man to achieve a single goal has ever been. Yeah, let's go to the moon, put a man on the moon, bring it back within, within a decade. Wow. He didn't do it. Many thousands and thousands of people did it. Do you know how he did it? I get to play professor for just a few seconds. The first thing that statement says is he brings focus. It was very clear. Where are we going? The moon. When are we going? Less than 10 years. Very clear. How often in our life do we get that sort of clear direction? The next thing that happened was, and this is what you get when you're a president of a superpower, you get engagement. People joined in. They said, oh, you want to go to the moon? We're going to be part of that. Third thing was connection. It wasn't one company, one person, one organization. It was hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people made it happen. They were connected. Now, the cynical amongst us would say that only really happened because the President of the United States, through Congress in 1961, secured $25 billion of funding to go to the moon. In today's currency, that's $200 million. Billion. So, billion. billion. Thank you for that, billion. So, $25 billion or $200 million billion today brings a lot of focus. It says it's important, we're going to go. We know when we're going to do it. We don't necessarily know how we're going to get there completely. But we're going to do it. If only all innovation was like that. Well, we try. In Europe, back in two, uh, <coughs> pardon me, uh, 2001, 
the industry decided it had to do something. We had to try and make the improvements to sustain our industry. So what emerged was called the Strategic Research Agenda. In the beginning, created by an interesting group of people called the Group of Personalities. Nice title for a group. And it set out an agenda, what was important, what we thought we should be doing in terms of um, not harming the environment, increasing capacity, reducing cost, reducing delays and frustration and burden to passengers and society. That has recently been updated uh, 10 years later, 2011, for the next phase. First was Vision 2020, which is not so far away. And then now Flight Path 2050. This is the horizon we're trying to, we're trying to show. But can we wait for another 30, 40 years for the changes? Is that really the appropriate timeline for us to work against? Well, that was a vision. That was the setting out of the agenda. But that is pointless. Like any innovation, just having an idea or an agenda is nothing without action. So you need to take action. And one of the first responses in Europe was a major program called Clean Sky, focusing on environmental factors. This cut uh, noise and emissions and harmful things from the aviation, including all the manufacturing and production processes. The Clean Sky is a program running from 2008 to 2017. And midterm, here you see our uh, previous ex-boss, Charles Champion, head of engineering at Airbus and uh, sponsor of Flyer Ideas, key sponsor, uh, signing Airbus's contribution and commitment to the next phase. Now on the right hand side are all the things that this program is supposed to do, or aim to do, about smart fixed wing, that type of aircraft, helicopters, engines, equipment, there's a whole list of things they want to achieve. But on the left hand side, are the things that have to happen to make those things possible. And I'm afraid they're all legal. This is a legal commercial framework. This isn't spontaneous interaction between people with good ideas. This is a very well thought out, rigorous plan of action with a program, with legal framework, with signatories to make it work. It helps bring together many people, but it's very ordered and it is heavy. Organizing many people is heavy. This is a program of 1.6 billion euros. And currently there are 473 partner companies. It's a massive enterprise to do this. Wasn't the first. What preceded it back in um, uh, 2004 was the initiative to restructure European air, air traffic management air system. Because even back then, we knew that in order to grow in line with society needs, something had to happen about air traffic management. Bottlenecks. I don't know how many people have flown, but uh, too many people are now circling airports waiting to land, waiting to arrive, waiting to depart. The system is becoming overloaded. And that's right, well recognized both uh, in Europe and North America and around the world. So this is a big, big program, bigger than Clean Sky, 2.1 billion euro program. 2004 to 2020, not so many partners, but all the, the right people are there. Huge undertaking. What does this actually represent? There's an S-curve. How many people are familiar with S-curves? Ever seen an S-curve before? Yeah? Don't be shy, put your hand up. Has anybody seen one before? About well, a few people have. Yeah, it's, it's a very traditional way of trying to explain where you have a breakthrough in technology, where you learn. This curve, this, 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 this represents learning. And then over time, you run, uh, you begin to exhaust the potential of the technology, the system that you have. You then enter what is called the region of diminishing returns. You've got to spend more money, more effort, more time to get a smaller percentage increase. Now at this point, you're looking for something different because the old ways are not giving you the re results and benefits and improvements you need. Now, the need for big programs like Clean Sky and CESAR and NextGen in the US and so on are programs with the usual suspects, the usual players. They are people who understand the industry, understand the technology, understand what is needed. But not to put too fine a point on it, we are really up 
we believe we're up here. So why are we speaking to you today and the rest of this week is that Gregor and I exist in our company to try and do something different. Break out of the normal way of working, the things that just served Airbus for 40 years extremely well and the industry for even longer. And what we're asking you to look at is this little region here. Because there are key words on this slide, it's things like prospecting for new possibilities, exploration, experimentation, includes inventing. I'm not going to discuss the difference between invention and innovation. But this idea of prospecting, because today, compared with 40 years ago in aviation, we have amazing things in our hands. The fact that we can stream video online to the rest of the world, have chats and texts and tweets and, S and all this type of stuff means that we do not necessarily only need or have to rely on big ordered, heavily expensive, slow to move, industry initiated change. Why can't we take benefit of all the great minds around the world? And I'm looking in this direction now, more than in our direction, because you are the future, not us. We've not got so long to go. You're the people who are going to deliver this change. You're the people who are going to help us move the industry and society somewhere. But can, do you need to be part of a major program or can you contribute yourself? We think you can. We think that the right people, if you become focused, if you choose to engage in helping us in our industry and for society, and you're able to connect together, you can build the bricks which combine bring us somewhere different. They're not pre-planned, they're not well structured, they're not part of one program, but it's a little bit like viral. It's about connectedness. It's about building those little new increments and taking us places we haven't yet imagined, but will help us sustain the, the direction we want to go, in which we want to go. So, what you've just heard is aviation is complex. It's needed. It's got a lot of potential to further grow. Actually, we've got to enjoy some 5% or 4.7% in average growth per year, over 20 years averaged uh, for the moment. And that's going to continue for quite a while, as long as we get the traffic jams in the air under control. But the big organizational capacity we do have today is used of just climbing up that nearly exhausted uh, S-curve a little bit further. And what we want to do is we want to go on the new S-curve, and we can't do this alone. Later on, when it's needed, we're going to be able to organize it again. But for the moment, we need fresh blood. We need you. And we want to explain you a little bit on how that works in the rest of uh, the course of the week, but the rest of this presentation as well. So it's about doing it with you, explaining you how it works, and where you shouldn't be frustrated if something looks terribly complex, and where you should just say, hey, that's an opportunity, and this is how I could interact. I want to give you a couple of examples. What we're going to do for the rest of this um, session here is we're going to show you a couple of sequences from a film Abbas was doing a while ago and ask you what do you think. So look closely on it. It's important to see that. But why this film was made, I want to explain on one further slide and then we go to the movies. A couple of years ago, four years ago, we've asked many, many people throughout the world about what they expect that we do in the future. And if you ask people what they expect from the future without making a proposal on how it could look, they give you figures like these. 85% roughly want to burn less fuel, want to produce less CO2, want biofuel to be involved, want less noise. That's quite obvious. Everybody, well, we didn't need to ask for that. We knew this before. They didn't tell us what type of luxury they want. They didn't tell us what type of additional services they want. They can't imagine what it is. And if we would ask you now, what do you think we should work for and what should you get involved for in the future, you wouldn't know. You wouldn't have an idea on how to tackle this. But a couple of years ago, we started two initiatives, or actually it's one initiative with two flavors, which is Future by Abbas. We said, if we just ask for what they believe, we just get the usual answers. But if we provoke them by showing a prototype future, if we show them how the future could like, they will all tell us what's wrong and what's good and what should be uh, done and what should not be done. So giving that type of uh, prov provocation view on the future has helped us a lot to understand what society really wants. The second flavor within the same program was the Fly Your Ideas contest where we uh, asked students to come up with 
um, their vision of what should be done. And again, there's quite a number of usual replies, but there are the few exotic contributions which really um, made us think. And one of them was the team Leva, which was winning the Flyo Ideas contest last year. They came with, with a very fresh, very lively proposal to us, and we've really been fascinated about it. The price to the university, who has been supporting it, is that we are here and, and do the Innovation Week. Um, but the interaction with the team itself was rewarding for both sides <coughs> as well. So yeah, we've done that, and we continue to do this. There's going to be more Flyo Idea contests, and you're all uh, warmly encouraged to join the next ones. So, Future by Airbus is a provocation. If you don't like it, tell us. That's why it's made for. We'll have a couple of short scenes and we're going to ask you a couple of questions about it, so watch out. So this film was done um, as a 3D uh, IMAX type of movie and it's really impressive if you sit in a dome and see everything flying in 3D. It is made for broad public, broad public uh, for kids, for housewives, for ministers, for engineers, for everybody. So some people don't like the style, some do like the style, but it has worked very well and it's going to work with you as well. The story, which we will not show completely but just that you're not disturbed, is a little girl comes to her house and uh, the girl sees potential future offers in little snow globes. And then they go from one to one and we have picked a couple of them to discuss about. Some are science fiction, some are quite real, some are actually something we do have in the lab already. Uh, try to find out which ones are which. So fast forward to the next scene. Today, civil aviation represents 2% of greenhouse gas production, but it has nevertheless undertaken to halve its carbon emissions by 2050. Is this really feasible, given that the population of the world will have nearly doubled by then? Carving up nature to build new land-based infrastructures would have disastrous consequences on the environment. Because air transport takes up less ground area and fewer building materials, we should use the sky's unlimited space and leave the ground for farming and preserving biodiversity. From that clip, the suggestion is the right thing to do is not to dig up the ground, is to invest in more aircraft. And we are likely to say that because we're employed by setting aircraft. Yeah, we have a real good interest in selling more aircraft. That doesn't mean we'll sell aircraft at any cost. What do you think? Where should the money be spent? Your taxpayers' money, future taxpayers' money? Yeah, where should it go? Uh, I think we live on the surface of the Earth, and we have two sides, the air and the underground. I think the, the way to explore the underground is more profitable because you have the old way to do things by air because it's very easy, it's soft, but the underground is a whole possibility that nobody thinks about it. Yeah, we've really recently there's been a lot of publicity from a guy called Elon Musk. Anybody heard of Elon Musk? Yeah. A few nods? Who's Elon Musk? Tesla. Tesla. Yeah. PayPal, Tesla, SpaceX. Do you know what the publicity was about? Can you think which one? And it wasn't about Tesla and it wasn't about SpaceX. He he proposed like a uh, uh, a new kind of transportation between San Francisco and Los Angeles. Yeah, yeah. The hyperloop. He's claiming that you can build this, this vacuum tube of near supersonic transport speeds. Yeah, and it would be far more effective, far more efficient, far better than other conventional infrastructure projects like rail and like air. 
I don't know what the figures are, but it's quoted around a few billion dollars to do that. Is that the way? So we build tubes, physical tubes on the ground. Is that where the technology should be driven, the money and investment? How many people think a Hyperloop is a good idea? Why do you think it's a good idea? <laughs> Just because it's sexy? Yeah, it's <laughs> cheaper and faster. I don't know. Cheaper and faster? If it works. If, if it works. Yeah. OK, so <laughs> where, where, how are we going to work out if it works? Try it. Yeah. This, is, this is one of the big issues with innovation. We hit what is, in English, often referred to as the chicken and egg problem. What comes first, the proof? or the money. And often the money depends on the proof and you can't prove it until you get the money. And So how do you do, how do you take the first step? How do you gamble? Do you gamble? You know, these are huge figures, huge sums of money and effort. Yeah, how can you be certain? And the bottom line is you can never be certain. If you can be certain, then what you're doing is what you've already done for the last 30, 40 years. Innovation is inherently about risk taking, but it's about managing that risk taking. The issue we have is that for some of the challenges, you are not just betting one company, you're betting a huge set of backers and investors who demand to be guarantees. So Hyperloop is sexy, it's very attractive, it may work. But in terms of supporting the type of travel or the type of mobility that we see in terms of growth, how many Hyperloops would you need to have? Because you've got to multiply that by San Francisco, LA, San Francisco, Vegas, Vegas to where? To New York, to Washington. Okay. And, what, and what happens if you want to go to Mexico or down to, yeah, so there is a, a structural limit. That's not to say it's a bad idea, and maybe for some situations it's a good idea. But who decides? Where's the balance? It's got a lot of publicity, and I'll give him credit mm -hmm. for that. And I like it, by the way. And, and actually, um, <coughs> a very good question is, who would be the industry to do this? It's not Elon Musk. Elon Musk has made lots of money with the PayPal system, and he invested in endeavors which are cool, and some of them do make a little money. But he's not big enough as an organization to do the Hyperloop. So he's looking for partners. And somebody like us would need to, to step into this to do it. So we have to take a decision. But for that, we would like to know, is it the future you like? We have to find out. So that's part of why we do this. I almost forgot that on the little corner here, we've got a statement that society needs both. And the both is, should we, have, should we need, should we be obliged to make a choice between mobility, our ability to travel, and the environment? Because to be frank, the way things are going in terms of emissions, in terms of pollution, in terms of energy, energy resources, there's quite a growing school of thought that, hey, the best thing to do is not to travel. How do you feel about that? Do you care? Do you care about travel? You do? How many of you got Facebook accounts? You got to get one. How many people Twitter or tweet rather? Yeah, or, or use any other social media? Do you still need to, need to travel? You can hang out with people all over the world as we are doing today. And this technology is supposed to kill us, by the way. It's supposed to make aviation obsolete. You believe it? Good, thank goodness. Yeah, yeah we, we still grow by 4.7% <laughs> per year. So that's, that's not happened, happened yet, but it's something we have to reflect about. We are not here for just doing again and again and again what we've been doing over the years. We have to see how the future is going to look like. And if something like Hyperloop, something like Facebook, is swapping over into our terrain, we have to have a look and we do this. And that's quite enjoyable, by the way. OK, let's go a little bit further. The ideal situation would be to develop superconductivity and free ourselves from gravity same, constraints. Same video? Same video, right? Then trains could run. It's okay. No, it's the same video again. No. No, 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 no. it was okay. You just it was okay? It was okay. Yeah. Could you click on somewhere on the no. Whatever happens. No, on before. You just click on the screen now. Okay. Click on the screen. You, you do it. The ideal situation would that. be to develop superconductivity and free ourselves from gravity constraints. <laughs> then trains could run on a type of electromagnetic track all around the world. Oh. 
In cities, this sort of technology would also revolutionize the traffic. But we're not there yet. Where I grew up, which is a long time ago, maybe some people think I haven't grown up yet, but when I was a kid, I loved comic books. And every comic book had something that looked like this. Flying cars, three-dimensional movement. This is where we're going to be. In fact, I can probably list about half a dozen or if not a dozen more movies which are still suggesting that that's the way to go. Do you think? Who wants a flying car? Hey, hands up. Who honestly would like to have a flying car? I would. Yeah? Yeah, I would. I want one. I love cars. Yeah. How much you prepare to pay for a flying car? How much do you have? Oh, wow. oh. Now let's investigate that. Yeah, yeah, that's a good one. That could be good, yeah. Yeah, yeah because flying cars is going to take some, some serious investment from somebody to do that. And by the way, how do they fly? How do they organize? How do they stop you know, three-dimensional accidents? Can you imagine that? It's bad enough hitting the car in front of you in two dimensions, let alone doing one above and one below. It's, uh, wow, shudder to think. It'd be good, good, good business for the insurance company. Should we invest in that? Because if you say, is that what we really want? And if so, are we going to focus our energy and engage all the right people to make it happen? How much energy, how much effort is being invested in flying cars today? Any idea? I don't think it's number one on the, on the hit list for the top automotive companies. Electrical vehicles certainly are, or hybrids or something like this. Not flying cars, but there are other people who are doing that. Yeah? There are other, other people. Starting small, little, taking an ordinary uh, saloon car, a uh, family motor car, and trying to make it fly. You've got to start somewhere. But boy, is it going to be a long, slow journey if that's the way we go. Because there are fundamental things which have to happen to change that, uh, to make it happen, to make that breakthrough. And today, maybe... They're not really there. Yeah. So some of what you need to make flying cars a reality is an automation of some extent. And that's actually happening in the car industry. They do look for automation. They do little um, assistants who, who help you driving automatically. There are some tryouts with full automated cars, but these are not, not close to um, becoming real on the streets. And we do the same in aviation. We look at automation, more and more automation of um, the actually piloting task. So from a technology point of view, at some point we might be close to this, but still somebody's got to take the choice if you want that. So that's not so obvious. Again, let's go a little bit forward to the next. Whatever scene. happens, tomorrow's aviation industry depends on the solutions it finds to the energy problem. Energy has always been a major concern for aviation, not originally for ecological reasons, but in order to increase range or reduce costs. Since the 1960s, commercial airliners have cut their fuel consumption by 70%, their CO2 emissions too. Now that these emissions have become so important to humankind, the aviation industry is well placed to find solutions. Already, a passenger on board an Airbus A380 only uses three liters of fuel per hundred kilometers. And we can always improve on something that already exists. Future generations of aircraft will continue to save fuel up to the last drop before moving on from fossil fuels for good. Hydrogen as a fuel is too bulky. And above all, as it doesn't exist here on Earth in a pure form, an awful lot of energy would have to be wasted to produce it. Fuel cells that use hydrogen and oxygen from the air to produce electricity could never apply to commercial aviation. However, because fuel cells are quiet and non-polluting, they will replace batteries and power generators for stopover needs. Solar power is the epitome of renewable energy. But even if photovoltaic cells hugely increase their output, they could never make a passenger plane fly. On the other hand, they could provide electricity on board once the aircraft has reached cruising level. 
there is a more subtle way of using the sun's energy. If you give certain algae seawater, sun and carbon, the same carbon we're trying to get rid of, they start growing and yield an oil from which we can make a fuel very similar to present-day kerosene. Because algae require neither fresh water nor the land used for farming, biofuels made from a biomass may well be key players in the future of aviation. So we take care of that energy supply thing. Since many years we look at it, um, oil has uh, quite varying prices over the years. Uh, and we always thought it's going to end. We're not going to have some we can fly with very soon. But we found more. We have fracking today and so on. Um, so there is still a little bit of it around, but we are not really happy with the fuel. However, all the other opportunities bring lots of disturbances in one way or the other with it. So basically, kerosene is still the optimum way to fuel the airplanes. Um, the, the power density, the ease to handle it, and the global supply is, is close to unbeatable for the moment. So you need massive investments in many areas to get over this fossil fuel thing. The last point you've seen here, the algae fuel, is just a, a substitution of the fuel. There is no other thing to be changed on the airplane, very few things at least, only, and you can just drop it in the in the tanks as you do today and it does fly. So no infrastructure change needed, just a singular solution. So we all favor this one. It seems to be in reach. But much better, much more flexibility would be gotten out of that if we would have electricity to fly the airplane because we can produce it in many ways. We just have to port it on the airplane somehow. So what do you think? The statements which were made in the film about solar power can never propel or fuel an electric aircraft, a passenger aircraft. Is that true? What do you think? Hands up if you think we can never fly with solar power alone. The problem with the solar power is that there is not enough energy coming from the sun for the square meters an airplane has. So you cannot get em enough out of it at the moment you, you use it. But if you would have a good storage, you potentially could. So you wanted to say that actually it's a storage problem yeah. more than anything else. Yeah, doing it in flight won't work and having a real good battery set could, could do the deal. Now where, where could that come from? Is that a job for aviation industry to deal with or could it come from the car industry? Who, who, who would make that breakthrough thing to have electric storage capacity to be capable of using solar energy harvested somewhere uh, to bring to the airplane. Who should develop this one? Is it us? Do we look at the automotive industry who is investing lots of money? Is it the stuff which is uh, fueling your mobile phones today? Where is that breakthrough going to come from? Everywhere. From everywhere. We cannot do it alone. We need to open up to other industries. Now, opening up to other industries is quite difficult if you have a fully regulated organism as we have it. And the guys who build cars have a totally different approach of things. So it's a major effort from both sides to move into co cooperation or co-innovation on that one. And we have to be selective because we cannot do it for all topics. So we have to select which ones we do want to, to work on. That's not easy. Should it be us? Shouldn't it just be the responsibility of the energy companies? Shouldn't they just do it? We, we are customers after all. So it's not the not the customer who invents, it's our creates. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'll check it out. It's not the customer. Surely it should be the supplier. Isn't the supplier responsibility? Sort out the mess? No? And this is one of the difficulties. Whose responsibility is it? People who pay, the people who can supply, the people, or everybody. And when it soon becomes an everybody type problem, then it's a nobody type problem. Because why is it only me? You should help. You should help pay as well. You should do your bit. And how do we get that sort of cooperation without all the huge, heavy management organization we've, in, we've already shown in other slides? So an everybody problem can often become a nobody problem. 
because it doesn't belong to any one person. And to be frank, in a large corporation, a large company, that's something we face every day. Where problems don't fit one part of our business, they fit the business and require the participation and your involvement of many different engineering functions, finance, procurement, marketing, sales and support. And they all need, and all our programs, and they all need to contribute, but who does it belong to? Everybody and nobody. So as part of our job is to be the somebody on behalf of the business in order to bring those things into our company. Now that's what we do internally. Who, who's the corporate innovator for energy? There isn't one. So somehow we need to have that way of working that it becomes a, an everybody problem, becomes an everybody solution, even without this heavy management organization and structure. Um, I was just thinking about this, uh, who is the corporate innovator for it? I mean, propulsion is something we do since many years. We integrate engines into our airplanes, and we've got a department which is very good in doing this. But electrical drive, and in particular storage, is not their business. The system people, the systems people who do the batteries we have on an airplane are way uh, uh, below the amount of energy to store than the engines would need. So they say, oh, that's a different scale. We can't do it. So nobody feels in charge of actually taking the action. So we need to organize this somehow. There's one more chicken and egg problem there. They often say, well, we might be prepared to do it if you guarantee and commit the business. Provide us the business, we will invest in order to take the steps to get that, maybe. But we, how can we take that step because we don't know if it's going to work? We don't know if it, how long it's going to take. We don't know if it's the right direction. And it's that, this uncertainty which is, again, holding us back. And one of the key features of innovating is try things fast. Don't spend too much money and don't spend too much effort to get yourself that confidence you're going in a good direction. But doing it on this scale for this type of problem, is that suitable? Let's move on. You? On the far more densely populated planet of 2050, there could be up to four or five times more aircraft in the sky. But what's the good of designing aircraft that use less fuel if it just serves to keep them flying round and round overloaded airports? Today, we have to respect very extensive safety distances between aircraft, as though each one was wrapped in a huge protective bubble. Tomorrow, through progress in navigation, surveillance and communication technologies, these bubbles could be significantly shrunk. Aircraft could follow each other far more closely with enhanced safety. They could even fly in formations, like migrating birds, in a sky managed on a worldwide basis. What do you think of flying formation? Science fiction, science fact. What do you think? You can do it? Yeah? Good, I'm glad of that because, yeah, we have done it. It's one of the demonstrations Airbus made a couple of years back. You can do it, the technology is there. A large part of the um, CESAR program, program is not dedicated to form, uh, flying information, but it's certainly about reducing the separation between aircraft and making better use of the space uh, in all dimensions of the sky. Who do you think we would need to make that happen? What, what is the prerequisite to be able to fly information? We need to have some safety measures to get this distance thing under control that, that was said, but what else needs to happen? Regulations, yeah, it's forbidden to some extent. You need certain uh, distances uh, to be maintained today. But, um, well, first of all, you need more than one plane flying in one direction at one point in time. 
So several airplanes need to join a route. Do we have enough? What do you think? Do we have enough airplanes flying long distance at the same time, roughly the same time, uh, at any point in time? Could that be a business model? Yep. Yeah, we, we did investigate about this and actually there are some areas in the world which would allow to do this on a daily, on a regular basis where three, four, five airplanes who have roughly the same uh, departure time and a long common way to go uh, before they have to split again and go somewhere else. Yeah. So the question was if we have enough capacity in the airports to make the number of airplanes uh, coming in at the same time uh, land or take off again. Well actually they don't have to land on the same airport. You could have 5,000 kilometers of uh, formation flight and then they split to reach two different or three or four different airports. So uh, there is a point in what you say, but it's just half of the, um, the reality. Actually, the other point is if you have the capability to land very closely coupled as well or to take off as a package information, the regulation which is limiting the capacity on the air traffic control side today would go away as well. So if you go a little bit further, not just take the we fly information like the birds, but you take the we take off as one thing. We take off in a package, we land in a package, you have far more opportunities to do it. There is a way to do this which is a little bit in the future and again forbidden regulation would need to change but if you if you rescope it a little bit it becomes more likely to actually make it happen. Yes we think we could do it. Now the question is why should Airbus go for that? The airline saves money because they burn less fuel some 10 percent could be actually saved and Airbus would have to or any other aviation company who wants to do this would have to develop technology to make it happen. But why should we? We are not saving the fuel burn. We cannot guarantee the airlines that they're going to save fuel. They're going to do it by joining into formation. But we are not involved in this so far. So how do we make money out of that? It's probably good for the airlines, but we need to make a business which justifies our investment as well. And certainly, we don't want to have just Airbus and Airbus being able to join a formation. We would want to have everybody capable of joining a formation. So what do you think we need to do to, to transform this uh, value proposition for the airline into a business for us? Any idea? We, we thought about it for a while and we thought well maybe there is a brokerage agency type of model which could make that happen. We could have the provisions, technical provisions under our control but actually we would make the money from sus subscription fees. We could make it a service instead of a technical feature and then it could work. Um, Just yeah. want to throw in is but an another little insight to innovation. One of the most frequent questions opposed to us is do you just do technological innovation? I hate this statement. So just the example that Gregor has given. The technology is one thing. Technology can be developed, the technology can be deployed, uh, de deployed. What makes it work is a business model. This is a financial instrument. And often we forget that when we innovate, you need not maybe a little bit of technology, you need an organization, you need ways of working, processes, protocols, rules, policies. You also need the right financial structures and the right uh, supply chain and partnership models. And these are the things which tend to get left off the list while people are deep into the emotion of a new technology, this wonderful gadget and widget. Unfortunately, you, look, you need to look at the complete package because it takes a complete package for something to be successful. And our uh, history is littered with good ideas which have hit the market and then a few months later have disappeared because there are elements which are missing. And maybe the time wasn't right, the environment wasn't right. The situation, the circumstances weren't right. What we also have on that slide is the some things cannot start small. If you want to do something like this, you've got to have that spanning the globe. Every airline, everywhere, every type of operation needs to be able to do it, otherwise the airlines won't use it. So we have to introduce this simultaneously all over the world. Not so easy.
the airports of tomorrow will have to be much more practical than today. Taking a plane could be as simple as taking the subway. Passengers could also board the modules in advance before the plane actually arrives, as could baggage and freight. In fact, why make a distinction between aircraft and airport? Because they're all part of the same ensemble that transports people and goods. Aircraft and airports are set to develop together in a world where travel is a pleasure, not a time waster. The airport business model we elaborated a little bit on before, but we could change it. We could make it a part of the air operations as well. That was one of the topics in that little clip. And there are a couple of other things which are shown in here which are quite interesting. The passengers today stand in a queue, board the aircraft in an ordered or not, not so ordered manner, that depends. And then they queue within the aircraft in order to store their luggage. Then they finally sit down and then they take off. After landing, they do the other way around, the same thing. They queue and queue and queue and queue. And, well, nobody likes boarding and deboarding. You've seen a couple of ideas on how you could do it differently. You could have containers, pods, which are loaded on ground and just pushed into the aircraft. Um, quite a number of the flyer ideas teams in the, in the last three loops have proposed containerized, what we call podular designs, where something actually can be boarded conveniently on ground and is then just mounted or transported into the aircraft. What do you think? Could that be something? A container which is loaded on ground and you board it from all sides, ease, pleasure, and then it works into Is it science fiction? Is it thinkable? I would like it a lot, I know. But I'm not sure it's doable. Maybe because of security measures or... Okay, so we need a, a brick on security. Yeah. So there are other enablers we need to have in place. Yeah, good point. But then if it worked, then it would be really nice. Yeah. yeah. Well, we, it, it actually, it's form of rapid transit. Metro systems are like that. Doors open, people get on. How many of you have visited theme parks? Theme park is one of the most efficient transportation systems on the planet. It's based on getting people through the ride. The way you queue you up, they put you on in blocks, they close the door, and away you go. Very efficient. The number of people they get through the system on a day is quite remarkable. Is that something we want to see in our industry? Is this, this queuing and forcing people through the system and scare the hell out of them? No. Maybe it is in one situation, maybe it's not in others. But the big question is, you know, we can imagine that. We, are, we can conceive aircraft that can fit into that model. But Gregor showed a slide earlier about the, um, the interests of airports. There's no criticism on our colleagues in the, in the airport industry. But the question is, that what's in it for the airport? Just imagine, no queue, no insecurity, how long it takes to get into the plane. You don't come early. You don't linger around in the airport. Mm -hmm. And you don't buy anything. The airports would go bankrupt quite rapidly. They have no real interest in, in, in cutting the queues. Uh, they hear the complaints, they have to react, of course, but from a financial point, the queues are securing their business to some extent. So they don't want everybody to just know how it works and move in. Take it a little bit further. Think that this pod is not loaded in the airport, but downtown. And the bus brings the whole pod to the airport, and the pod is loaded to the aircraft on the airport. There's no business, no parking lot, no shopping mall, no nothing for the airport left. So they won't support it as such. So innovation is about making the case for them as well. You need to bring them all on board. All players need to be uh, uh, equipped with a genuine interest in getting something new done. As long as we stay in the business model we have today, everybody's got his piece. We just have to improve every little bit a bit. Yeah, that works, but it becomes more and more tedious. If you want to go to the next, what we didn't elaborate on, by the way, the next social S-curve, if you want to really change the way it's used, we've got to involve many players and break down these barriers. And this is a, an, an example, a use case of where innovation for somebody, remember innovation is about making something better, change for better. 
innovation to make things better for somebody can often result in something becoming a whole lot worse for somebody else. And those people who are going to lose or feel they're losing are going to start to dig in and object and raise all manner of arguments and political lobbying and everything else that will stop change. And we see that across the world in many different dimensions. So as Gregor said, in order to innovate, there's got to be some sense of a, a win-win here, not a winner and loser, because the losers are not going to take it lightly. Likewise, if somebody comes up with an innovation that completely makes aviation obsolete, we are not going to let it sit back and take it uh, quietly. So Elon Musk is not necessarily a friend. <coughs> the future passenger cabin will, of course, be ecological. No more non-renewable materials like metal and plastic but fully recyclable plant fibers that can be grown to the desired shape. The materials of the decorative elements will, of course, be self-cleaning. Some will even be designed to repair themselves in case of impact. Most of the aircraft's components could have several different physical states. Opaque or transparent, as you wish. They could also change shape, like the limbs of living creatures. Nobody really needs that. I mean, look through walls. What is it good for? It doesn't create value as such. Any idea why, why we think about transparent walls? Actually, a window in an airplane is a pretty difficult thing. You, you, you have a, a pressure vessel, basically, and you cut a hole in it, and then you have to seal it again, and you have to reinforce structure. So the windows, the individual windows we got today, are um, quite a burden to carry. So thinking about making these windows kind of load carrying and transparent still at the same time is serious research. However, that what we've seen here goes far beyond that one. Would you like that? Would you like transparent walls? Would you like to see the world above you, left of you, downwards? Do you think that's good? Who wants a transparent cabin? Put your hand up. Yeah, put your hands up. That's usually a polarizing one. Some people just say, I don't want to see that mess outside. I mean, Think about takeoff and landing. Um, you don't want to see through the cabin floor. Or do you? Yeah, some say no, some say yes. So what do we do? Do we want to develop this? Do we want to test it in the market before we take a decision? No, we can't. We have to do it. We have to develop it before we can test it. So that's not easy. How do we find out what the passengers really want to do and potentially what they would be willing to pay? Would you accept that actually the, the look-through feature is not by a transparent thing, but by a virtual vision, a projection, an LED screen, which is giving you the outside view and no windows at all? Who would accept that? Okay, four out of the room have accepted. So for the other ones, how much do we have to pay you to accept the no-window flight? 20? 40? Let me reframe the question. How many of you play video games? All. How much time do you spend a day looking at a screen that big? Put your hand up. More than two hours a day? Yeah. Uh, okay. So you're accepting of living in a virtual world, huh? No? So you wouldn't accept that the inside of an aircraft becomes a completely virtual world? No, no windows and... All you have to do is look at something in front of you. No? You're that generation. We're too old for that. Anybody interested, I can tell you about the very, very first video game on the planet. I'm old enough to remember it. But this is your, this is your world, isn't it? It's our perception of old people like us, that uh, all the young generation are going to be quite happy you're living in a synthetic world. Isn't that right? They're not right. You, reality is okay. Reality is important. Seeing things, touching things, and uh, interacting with things, real things is important. That's good to know. Because that, that type of vision, that, you know, there are people who get paid to try and forecast 
human behavior and human needs, human wants. When you get it wrong, you get completely wrong products and services and development. So I'm very encouraged by that statement that reality is still very important. Fine, but in a normal airplane, that's the average size of a window in an airplane. The average distance from somebody sitting in the middle of the airplane is like this. How much of the reality do you see? So you board an airplane, you got to, one is lucky, he sits next to it. <laughs> he may shut down the blind and all the rest see nothing at all, but in average, you don't see anything of the world outside. A screen would give you actually a better insight. But still, most people are absolutely hesitant and they want real transparency yeah. and real world uh, touch and feel. We don't know why that is. We, we haven't really understood, but we are quite happy. Yeah, we are not the virtual uh, generation. But um, technically, doing something, replacing either the windows or the whole wall or the outside look in one way or the other by synthetic vision is possible. Some ent in flight entertainment systems of newer airplanes uh, have an option to see an outside camera view. Usually, the camera is mounted on the top of the fin and you see the airplane and the world moving below it. And that's the uh, most attractive uh, feature on the in-flight entertainment system. People love to see a camera view of the airplane. They don't look outside the window anymore, they look at the camera, but if you take away the window, everybody gets annoyed. We don't know exactly what to do with it, but yeah, we're gonna try it out, I guess. Oops. Much quieter than nowadays, aircraft will also offer the finest views ever of the world's marvels. What was wrong with that picture, pyramid below you, you stand there and look at it? You've seen the figures before, every minute 15 kilometers of distance, you wouldn't see anything. However, um, having a look through to see the world while you cruise over sounds pretty cool to me. Well, that's what the flight crew does. On the way out, they said uh, we flew from Amsterdam to Sao Paulo. And after about an hour, the pilot said, hey, for those of you sitting on the left-hand side of the aircraft, there's this wonderful view of Paris. Everybody run out. Look at the window. Yeah, it's great. We love it. See the world, the real world. Fly over the lakes and the deserts and the mountains. It's, what a way. It's the best place to see the world from. No? That's great. I didn't see it. But is it a necessity? Now we're talking about applying resources to problems. Money, effort, time, people. At which point do we go from we absolutely must have that. Now the energy problem I would argue is really in the necessity. We need it. We need to master that. But where does necessity flip over and become luxury? Things which are nice to have, but you know, it's not really necessary. And our life is full of that. And again, it's the borderline between necessity and choice. And the question is, who sets this borderline? Who decides? Who's making that choice? Is it us? Is it you? Is it um, the market just develops? We need to find out, and, and we do this by trying, and we, we invite you to help us in doing that. Um, this is science fiction as it is shown. However, uh, it brings a lot of thoughts to life, which are very fruitful in looking at what you do during flight. The in-flight entertainment system, renewal and stuff, is investigating this type of things in order to see what actually is really desirable and what you want to see on the systems. Unless, of course, you prefer the seclusion of a private cabin that can turn into an office or a bedroom or anything else you want thanks to virtual decor projection. Sounds unreal, but it's just around the corner. It's just around the corner, as Gary said earlier, the gaming industry is doing this every day. You've, you've got the glasses you can very, uh, carry today, which give you a close to perfect immersion feeling. You could do this on the airplane. You sit, well, very close, closer than you do in this room, but you could have the feeling of being alone somewhere in the forest. On, uh, 
technically that's feasible and people just get drawn into it as you get drawn into your game you get drawn into a cool site which is simulated in the airplane we've been working with uh, quite different participants of the gaming industry players game providers hardware providers trying to find out what we could use on board not in terms of gaming but in terms of creating immersive experiences that's quite fascinating to see how that works but what we've learned by this one is that the speed of renewal of the gaming industry is such high that we just can't cope with it if we would have certified one of those systems to fly on board it wouldn't be on the market anymore we, it would be obsolete before we have certified it we just can't be that fast and why is that because we've got millions and millions of players who want to see new games new technology every day so the industry makes a lot of money of building new machines new playstations new whatever and it's millions of people feeding and financing this development and we are just a couple of producers who have an interest to develop the same stuff so we don't want to pay that much money as all the billions of players and we just can't cope with it so we have to find a way to build on what the gaming industry is doing not do it ourselves but well play with them that's uh, something we've been trying a couple of times in the past we hope to get it done soon for the moment I think uh, you still have the feeling that your living room is better equipped than the in-flight entertainment system in our airplanes just a quick test who's looking forward to owning a pair of Google, Google glasses I am how long are you prepare to queue outside the shop or how many days before to get a pair yeah they're really cool yeah and uh, we've been testing them we've been um, finding a way to get somebody who can cope with that outside of the company by the way to bring us a pair and show us what we could do with the with the Google glasses we've been investing we didn't find something which we need next week but we've been providing the space environment for somebody who was a gamer uh, who brought the Google Glasses and had lots of fun in investigating this and that that could be you I mean this type of opportunity comes again and again doing something which you like which you are good at which you have found wherever and there may be an opportunity to come to a big company who is not capable of digging into this one and let you do it and even pay you for this so it's not just about aerospace engineering in our business we need gamers we need artists we need them all not too many of course but there is a room for this yeah, just to add on that, we had a good conversation with Fausto last night about comfort. Really subjective subject, comfort. You sat in those seats. I wonder how many of you are feeling comfortable. I think there's a variation of comfort across the room. And actually, comfort, they, they, what we need, uh, do, we, do we need uh, engineers or do we need psychologists and ergonomists? And there's a combination of people where you need to work together in order to master this thing called comfort. Now we used to know how to do that. Human fact, we've got uh, excellent world-class human scientists and human factors people. But the advent of the virtual world is beginning to screw with us. And not just us, everybody, because now you've got this other dimension in which affects comfort. The distraction, the, the uh, new different type of audiovisual. So those things which used to be classed as bringing comfort are just part of an increasing set. So there are new technologies, new disciplines, new things we need to bring, way beyond the classic traditional skills and tools that we have in our business. And that's why we want to throw this open to anybody of any discipline, not just engineers or aeronautics engineers, but gamers and psychologists and architects and anybody who thinks they've got something they'd like to bring and contribute. Vertical takeoff would be one way of gaining space in cities. Will we have flying aircraft carriers for our long distance flights? We'll just want to arrive at our destination in under three hours.
whatever the distance. Unless, of course, we decide to take our time and enjoy a trip with all the trappings. These flying palaces will make their money from casino takings, restaurants and other attractions, while the ticket may just be free. Um, well, I, I like that part. Um, the last one is about a different business model, flying for free. Somebody else pays for you. You may have heard a couple of days ago, some low-cost carrier has announced that they want to fly um, transatlantic for a price of eight, what was it, dollar, euro, don't know, per flight. But the cost is higher, so he has to subsidize it somehow, so one of these business models would need to apply. What do you think? Flying for free, is that a good idea for society? Yeah, it's not that. <coughs> no. How many of you take a subscription service to either video or music or something like that? How many of you actually pay not to have adverts and publicity? One or two, yeah. So, yeah, we're prepared to accept things in order to get it for free. Yeah? We were prepared to be targeted by merciless marketeers in order to get something for free. So, hey, we should join the party. Yeah, this is going to come somewhere in some form, <laughs> but we don't know when. And we don't know if we have to prepare. When we designed the A380, a big airplane with a big belly, uh, and in most of the cases, we cannot carry lots of loads with it, so we have volume, but we don't have weight we can put in. We thought about putting special things in, a pizza hut stand, for instance, or, or uh, some other revenue-bringing shops. And we offered this to the airlines, and none of these features was ever bought. The time wasn't right. But on the long run, having dining um, opportunities, high-class restaurants for the flights, and somebody really pays a high price for just getting the meal, and the flight is for free, could become an option. We don't know how to deal with this in detail, but we think it's going to happen somewhere. The rest was science fiction. So the film here is coming to an end, and uh, we are not exactly at the end with the, um, with the webinar, but I would like to make a couple of, of statements about this. You've seen the film in portions. We selected those. We could have selected the other ones. It would have, wouldn't have made a big difference, actually, which one we did take. Uh, we wanted to discuss a little bit with you about if that future provokes some thoughts with you. You haven't been overly reactive today. But what you said was along the lines we expected it, we hope to hear, and some of that is going to have an afterlife uh, with us. We're going to take it back and, and think about it. This film is something which was done a couple of years ago and has never been uh, released to public in full length. But you can see the portions of it on our website. There are several clips out of it uh, available if you ever want to look back into it. Um, and it's part, as I said earlier, of the Future by Abbas activity, which also is the Flyo Ideas uh, home base. And all the people who've been involved in making this happen uh, are kind of standing behind us today and looking at this. I would like to mention a couple of things which have happened in the past which brought us here. We said already we've got the Future by Abbas, uh, sorry, the Flyo Idea Contest 2013. One team from the university has been winning. You like to stand up, guys? Ah, oh, yeah. Go on, don't be shy. You are the reason we are here, so please stand up. Let's wave your hand about. Go on, don't be shy. Yeah, they did a fantastic job. Yeah. You give them a group a round of applause. <clears throat> we also got lots of people within Airbus, within the UNESCO, with within the supporting agencies who've been making this happen. That's. Uh, <coughs> not possible without doing it, and we couldn't enjoy this week without having it. And I would like to particularly thank one of them who is online, I hope, at least, Vicky Runcy, who has been organizing the contest last year, who is no, no longer doing this job, but we all remember her uh, for what she did here. Okay. We have a few minutes left, unless you all want to run out the door now, there's something more interesting back in the sun. You know, we live in this environment every day. We never see sunlight. We don't have social lives. We just work. <laughs> 
be proud of one. But uh, I'm going to turn up a lot music here again. Please stop it. So this is the future by Abbas. It's kind of the future by us. But we would like to see something about the future from you. That's what we would like to, to, to ask you for now. What was missing? What's the future you would like to see which you haven't seen in the last mm -hmm. hour or something? I was going to say. Yeah. Do you want to leave it to two old guys here to define your future? Or do you want to help shape it? I'd actually prefer to have the future by you. You're the guys with the imagination, hopefully the spirit and the drive to really help break us out of our thinking. Because, yeah, we've been in the company, in the industry, 25 years. And inevitably, you've been one place for one time, for a long time, you become a little perhaps fixed in thinking. So what, what future do you want? Do you want a future with aviation? If so, what type of aviation? Do you want one focused mainly on the, the needs, the essential? Just get me from A to B. Or do you want something that's going to go over to the future, you know, Casino, swimming pool, play golf in the air type. I see a lot of beauty things, but the most important for me in transportation is about the time, you know. I can take a lot of things if you let me go to other place in 30 minutes. In the subway, we have, we have lines here that you don't see the sun, and it's good if it's fast. And I think the... I don't know, it's a question, but it's the future of aviation or transportation? Because if I say, I have a teleportation here, I can give you the technology right now. Are you interested? Because it's the end of the, the airplanes, you know? There is certainly some hesitation in provoking the end of building airplanes. Uh, yeah. However, um, yeah. if, if technology would develop in that way, we might want to reconsider what type of company we are. You know, Airbus is part of a, of a group, the Airbus group, which has a motto of saying we make things fly. But fly is a, is, a, is a metaphor for something. So if teleportation would come along, we would probably be in that business as well. Um, but I take your point about the time. I mean, you can fly faster. It was one, one of the airplanes which were shown in the last clip mm. was hypersonic. But actually, the time you need to travel from door to door is to a small extent actually dependent on the flight itself. Most of it is queuing up, getting to the airport, which is far away, queuing up, security checks, waiting for the last passenger to get his stuff sorted out, mm -hmm. the pilot checking everything, then some passenger didn't show up and his bags need to be removed again, then finally you, you go on the flight, then you are in the waiting queue to land, and so on, then you're waiting for your baggage. So you, you spend all your time in waiting. And that is what makes air traffic actually only worthwhile if there is a certain distance. That's why high-speed bullet trains where they are available are so successful, because all that queuing up doesn't happen. So that's a weakness of the system we have today. We invest lots of time in preparing to finally get on the flight. We fly it at the sound of speed, uh, the speed of sound. Um, that's pretty fast, but still it takes six hours to get from one place to the other if you are not, not lucky. Mm -hmm. There's a point. Interestingly enough, I think just about every manufacturer in the world, aircraft manufacturer, is just about capable of producing a supersonic aircraft. We work for a company that did it. We're in contact with people who do it, with supersonic biz jets. The issue is actually people are not prepared to pay that much for time. There is a limit. There is a threshold. And actually, beyond a certain threat, they say, no, 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 it's just too expensive. Because it's not a nice linear relationship between how much time to how much money in the ticket. There's a significant escalation in cost to go supersonic, to go hypersonic. And yeah, you put, there are so many schemes, NASA has schemes, schemes in Europe, and China and Asia, that you could build that aircraft. You could do it. But the question is, are people prepared to pay? Uh, my family is from a faraway town. I live in another really uh, other region of the country. Uh, for me, the uh, the biggest problem is not about time, because I can sp I can even spend more time if it's cheaper and it's not comfort. I have options of bigger uh, seats, 
and though I'm a, above average in, in size, I prefer taking <laughs> a smaller seat to pay low. And for me, as low as I pay, as much as I can travel to my hometown. So I think the future should be directed in order to make bigger planes and cheaper passes. It's you know, not so yeah, about yeah. time. There's a question of providing the choice. If you want to fly cheap and you, you well, take lots of uh, nuisances um, on you, you should be able to do so. If you want to have luxury and you have to pay a little bit more, you should be able to do so. How do we do this in one business model to be found? So that's the question. You pay, let's say you pay, I, don't know, I use American currency, $30 for a seat. And that seat means that the, where you sat at the moment, you've got a little bit of space between your legs, your knees, and the seat in front. Move forward. How much is that worth? Move forward again. Keep going. Now put your legs right up against the seat in front of you. Yeah? You prepare to pay $40 instead of 30 if you had another two centimeters of space. When you actually sat in the seat, psychologically you're prepared to pay more money for that seat than you were online before you knew how little space there was. Yeah? Choice is very subjective. When you haven't got a choice, you pay more. Yeah? Uh, this is, and this is a strange thing we have to deal with. Uh, we have rigid, fairly inflexible configurations of aircraft, yet when people will get on board, you know, they'll buy stuff. They'll buy a bit of extra leg room. They will perhaps pay to be away from the crying kids at the back or front or middle. Yeah, they'll pay for stuff because when you're in the environment, you go, I don't like it, I want to pay. Yeah, so it's not easy for us to decide what to do because what people tell you at one point in, in time is not what they will tell you at another point in time when they're experiencing something. So this, again, is one of the challenges we face in that exactly what should we provide? Is it pure minimum pitch, high capacity, lowest ticket price, everything? Or, but even then, it begins to fall down because, as Gregor indicated in one of the clips, in order to get the free ticket, maybe we need to have different aircraft with different configurations with a really sexy technology, an immersion environment. Some exp you're paying for the experience, not the flying, and you get it for free. But you're not because you're paying in somebody else for some other purpose. And this is why it's so difficult to try and predict the future, which way it's going to go, because it's based on what people think they're prepared to do. And whenever we ask people, they tell us, oh, lower, lower emissions, less fuel burn, you know, an, an extra seat plan uh, with our uh, pitch. So it's a really, really difficult job to try and predict the future. And when it takes billions and billions of of um, euros, dollars, or whatever currency to make it happen, that uncertainty about investment holds us back. It stops us from taking the big steps and having the confidence. Anybody else wants a future? Uh, from what I saw in this film, um, the, the, the focus one was on, on big airplanes, especially white bodies and things like that. But uh, I think that we should look uh, also for regional aviation uh, to to make the really the world smaller, not just uh, a small distance from São Paulo to New York, or but a smaller distance from Goiânia to to uh, no Nova York. They don't have to come here to go. That uh, this might help the problem from uh, with the airports. Maybe thinking of of taking. Uh, people to their final locations, not just big hubs. Maybe this this could uh, lead to to some some other thinking. Yeah. Do you work for Boeing? Sorry. Do you work for Boeing? It's a joke because this is, this is one of the great uh, debates in the industry, right? And it's about the central business model. Without doubt, in terms of pure efficiency, I mean lowest cost, moving people between larger distances, a big aircraft is more efficient than a small aircraft. But then we come into time. What's, it more, what's more efficient for the passenger? To get on an aircraft and go immediately direct to where they want to go? I would have loved to go on an aircraft in Toulouse and arrived in Sao Paulo. Instead, I had to fly two hours north to Amsterdam to fly two hours back just to be where I was. You know, that's, but actually, that's cheaper from an airline perspective. 
And I had to go through a damned airport that I hated. I queue up again through more security. So what's the best thing to do? Because it's less efficient to take people direct than through a hub, uh, through a hub and spoke. Now, it's not, an all, it's not a one-size-fits-all type solution. And getting those balances right, those trades based on a number of conditions, very complex conditions, is one of the challenges for our industry. Yeah. Um, what you've seen in the film is just one <coughs> thing which is below the white body type of airplane, which is the flying cars. The only time it was mentioned here is uh, some science fiction notion. Um, actually, the uh, regional transport is very important. It's a very important sector of aviation. It's not our business. We have um, a sister company, ATR, which is doing regional um, aircraft. And we have lots of competitors, like in Brazil, who are uh, growing from that area into our market. And uh, we don't like that, but what they do with the regional aircraft is quite impressive. And uh, that's as much worth telling a story about the future as about the white body aircraft. But the future by Airbus was about the, the bigger ones, the above 100 seat airplanes. But you're right, that's missing in the picture. There's another thing missing in the picture, which is about services. This film did not really explain that an airplane, whatever size, actually is a platform for services. Because people don't want to, to they don't buy the seat. I mean, they buy the service to be flown somewhere. And uh, more and more, we develop additional services on that platform. And the platform needs to be prepared for, for taking the services, for providing the services afterwards. But the money is made with the services more and more. And that wasn't covered in the film, at least not in the portion we showed. I got a question from the people listening over the Google Hangouts, um, which is about, is there any scheme to join us I understand from the outside, to redesign the, the parts of an airplane. So difficult to see from just reading that, uh, that sentence. But what, what I found an interesting question is, do we have any open innovation type of contribution to designing or redesigning the airplanes? Good question. No, we don't. So far, we don't. We, we just do baby steps in developing any capability to do open innovation in that regulated environment. But we would like to. So if you have any proposals on how to do that, how to actually embark people who are paid by the hour but who have capabilities which could help us into our design processes, we would like to see this. Today we can't do it, but uh, yeah, we would be open for that. One more? <coughs> well, there was <laughs> That one? Um, we'll come back to that one. Uh, the are regulations a blocker to innovation? Sorry? Are regulations a blocker to innovation? There is a practical answer to this, which we've shown in the film, yes, because everything tends to be difficult to change. On the other hand, creativity comes from having constraints and living with them. So having a white sheet of paper makes it very difficult to design anything. But if you have to fit into certain constraints, into regulations, you become inventive. So dealing with the regulations is the way to move forward. It's not saying tear down all, all, all barriers, all obstacles. That's not the point. We are not dreaming of a world which has no regulation, not at all. But we want to find a way to cope with them in a proper way. This is the contradiction we have to deal with. Without regulation, we would have no industry. Because people wouldn't fly because bad things would happen. This is what happened back in 100 years ago where it was enthusiasts. There was a feeling that when you landed, it was an achievement. Today, when you land, it's not an achievement. It's an absolute must happen. Yeah, I still find it very disturbing on some flights where when the pilot makes a nice landing on the runway, he gets a round of applause. I'm not going to clap him. He's getting paid to do it in an aircraft which has cost billions to develop. It is normal to have a good landing. Yeah? And it's normal to have a good landing because we've evolved a set of regulations that assure the quality of the system. And without that, we would not be where we are today. And in that system, we also have standards. We talk about regs, we can talk about standards. And without standards, we would not, uh, would not be able to connect things from different parts of the industry. 
However, once you have regulations and standards, people want to hang on to them because they're there to make things work properly. And that's part of our day job is to say, well, you know, we've got to change something. And this regulation or this standard is uh, one thing we need to consider changing. What I would say is that behind regulation, the key principles never change. Wanting safe flights, safe products, safe service, safe everything, that does not change. How it actually appears is very dependent on a generation of technology. And what can often happen, not just now in our industry, but other industries as well, is as the technology will make obsolete those technologies which help shape the regulation. And actually, the regulations are out of sync with what you could do. And that's one of the challenges. How do you keep the regulations fresh and up to date and in line with what technologies can do? I remember many years ago, this is like an internal thing. Um, I was of a generation where you used to write software by hand. You code it. And the internal processes in the company were based on hand coding of, of of software, which meant that it would sure quality by, by reading and having a structure and a form for software. And then what happens, somebody invents a package that means you generate the code automatically. And now suddenly the old rules about how to code have gone out the window. All the methods and, the, and internal policies about hand coding have gone out. So does that mean we say we will never accept this technology because it doesn't fit the old way? No, it means that in terms of regulation, I think that's one of the challenges, not only for Airbus, but also the authorities themselves, is how to keep up to speed with the technology and ensure that the fundamental principles behind the regs are not affected, but the, the format or the form in which the regulations are framed do reflect the evolution and the advancement of technology. And that's one of the challenges, keep the regs fresh, keep them in the right context. Harry, you, you made one point uh, saying, this is our day job. And that links to a question we got from the audience outside as well. Is Airbus Innovator, is it a job? It's a delight. <laughs> it's it's a an delight. absolute delight. Is it a job? Yeah, it was a question. Well, strictly speaking, of course it's a job. We get paid to do it. And I think that's one of the big differences between a corporate innovator and, uh, and an entrepreneur. Normally with an entrepreneur, they invest their house, their friends' houses, their grandparents' houses, and everybody else's house and car just to get the money to do what they do or want to do. We get paid to do it. It is a job. However, I would say this about innovation in general. If innovation is only about, if it's only a job, then you're not an innovator. Because the main thing that makes an innovator get out of bed every morning is not the fact that you're going to get paid to do it. It's the fact that you passionately want to go and change something. And even though we work for a big company and a big corporation, the one thing that unites us, even though we wear different clothes and we come from different countries, is that we both fundamentally want to change something. It happens to be in aviation. We want to make it better for many different reasons. Yeah, we get paid, which makes it great. You know, they say that if you... Uh, if you get paid for, you know, for doing stuff, stuff you love, you'll never work another day in your life because it's, a, it's what you're passionate about. And in this, this instance, we are passionate about what we do. So it is a job, but unless, if you treat it as a job, you don't do it because it's difficult. It's challenging. You fight battles every day. You argue with people who disagree with your very existence, who say they know something better and why they develop something that worked perfectly well, so why go and change it now? You're constantly in, in contact with people who, some love you. They say, I, want, I need your help to go change the world. And then you get the other people who say, these weirdos, you don't want to talk to them. So our job is constantly about meeting people, connecting people, shaping people, bringing focus and engagement, helping to move stuff fast through a bit of difficult business. And we get paid for it, which is great. But the real reason I do it, I think Gregor does as well, is that we passionately want to change something for the, for the good and better. It is a job, it's a difficult job, but if you can bear it, it's wonderful. Um, now the question from the outside didn't come to hear about Gary's passion, or partially I guess, 
but uh, is it a job you can apply for? There are some individuals in the company who have that full-time, we are innovators, corporate innovators. We are two of them, there are some more, uh, but they are rare, they are not typical. We have 65,000 employees in, in Airbus and few of them are full-time innovators. There are some, but not many. That's not the type of uh, job you find every day. However, there is a component to innovating in a company which is about the competencies and skills you need to contribute to innovation, to let it happen, to support it, to organize it, to structure it. And indeed, this is something which is officially in all the catalogs of competencies and job descriptions we have in the company. Innovation is part of many jobs. Full-time, not so many, but as a, a major ingredient, it is quite common to many people in the company. And part of our role is also to maintain that set of right secondary skills for people to innovate within a big company. So I hope we have uh, transported a little bit of the difference between the garage startup and innovating in a big corporation. We've done it on the example of aviation, which is probably the hardest nut to crack on this one. Not many companies as, are as much regulated and difficult to change and have such a long waved uh, business as we have. Uh, but we believe if you can make it there, you can make it everywhere. So telling you about how corporate innovation looks and feels prepares you for something you can do in your life. And you can enjoy part of what, what Gary has expressed a minute ago uh, if you want to go for this. Doing the garage startup for most of the garage entrepreneurs is a very, very painful uh, journey. Most of them fail. They have no business afterwards and lots of debts. Some of you may just not want to do this. Doing corporate innovation is rather safe in terms of getting paid. That's true. You, you don't lose your job every second day or on every second innovation. That doesn't work. However, it's totally different. And you have to recognize that preparing to work within the industry or with the industry from outside, even as an entrepreneur, requires a special set of understanding of how this industry or similarly complex industries do work. We would like to encourage you to come back to the other sessions. We have um, kind of hangout events which are mentioned on the program you, you have at the exit, or probably they've been given to you already, where we are just there to talk to you. Come to us, ask us whatever question you want to ask us. We'll be happy to deepen these discussions a little bit with you. We have an opening ceremony for the, for the, the opening of the rest of the week tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Join us. There is a closing ceremony as well, but um, maybe more attractive, more important, in between, we got two workshops which we are animating, uh, which are about, well, it's two workshops which are interconnected. One is about the necessity of, well, what you experience during the flight. So what do we need to do to make everybody enjoy the flight? And the second one is about bringing this to further heights. How can we improve? what you experience during flight, be it in the cabin, be it in the airport, even further. Would be good to see you signing up and joining us. We think it's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be very practical, very hands-on, very interactive. And we'd love to have as many diverse people and backgrounds and skills to contribute to that. So if you want to come, great. If you have friends, you can bring with you even better. But uh, we're looking forward to it. And we're really looking forward to interacting with you guys further. Done? One more question? Well, we got a bunch of more questions from the outside, which are all good questions as far as I can say. Do we have more time? Do you have more patience to, to hear a little bit? OK. Uh, one of the questions, is the biggest issue what passengers are ready to accept psychologically? And does culture make a difference to what people want? Well, psychology is what innovation is all about in, in, in many respects. It's about convincing people to step out of their routine, uh, to make it happen. It's about passengers, customers, clients, whatever you call them, to accept that something new is coming, that they might want to pay for a couple of inches more seat widths, and so on. So it's lots about psychology. But is that the biggest issue? Um, it's one of the bigger ones, yes. Yeah, an aircraft is a very strange environment. 
where else in your life can you go and step into a, into a tube, strap yourself in and hang out with people you've never known before from all different parts of the world and spend the next three to ten hours flying around the world? Psychologically, it is a very, very special environment. Yeah? One of the jokes, so it's perhaps it's not such a joke, is how important the coffee machine is to safe flying. How important the toilets are to safe flying. And what we actually mean is when people become stressed in a very confined space, things can go wrong. So actually, the, this is where perhaps the psychology of the absolute low cost has a limit. Perhaps there's no absolute low cost because there is a limit to what people will accept psychologically and refuse to accept more. And then I think probably there is, this, a, there is a very cultural difference. If you're in a city, if you live in Northwest America where your next neighbor is about 15, 20 miles away, you like space, you do not like people. If you live downtown Shanghai, Tokyo, or any other the mega cities in the world, you're not Sao really Paulo. that bothered about, or Sao Paulo, you're not that bothered about people maybe. Or maybe it's the opposite way around. So it definitely is cultural. It is, it, there is, there are different expectations. And that's one of the challenges we have. And one of the things we need to consider for the future. We'll make no, no secret of the fact that m in general, commercial aircraft are designed for a Western market, to be blunt about it. Because that's where the industry really emerged and grew. However, the growth areas now, Asia, South America, are they the same needs? And then Africa, are they the same needs, the ex same expectations? Should it be the same type of comfort, the same type of facilities? We're now approaching a market which is so big that we can consider very different products for those markets. The car industry does it. So now we, the manufacturers, have to be sensitive to the fact that the uh, there are many cultures and, uh, and a diverse needs, a set of needs and expectations, and we need to take those into consideration. There's no longer one aviation fits all. And it comes back to the, the difference between need and choice. And cultural diversity leads to different feelings of choice. Yeah, in order to, to be up to speed with this, we basically are doing two things in Airbus, and that's true for all companies, I think. We try to, any, uh, to, to hire as many different uh, people with different cultural background as we can. Gary, you remember how many nationalities do we have in Airbus today? 100? 100 and something. Where we work something. in uh, headquarters, there are 57. And we all speak a very special form of English it's called Airbus English, and it's nothing they'll ever teach you. He school. doesn't understand it, yeah. I don't understand it. But um, so that's one thing. The other one is we try to go international as much as we can. So Fly Our Ideas is a contest for the rest of the world. And the most contributions are not coming from the traditional Western countries, but from the rest of the world. And we are very, very happy about that one. I'll take one more. He said, what do you think about airships taking over cargo transportation? The cargo market is growing strong and steadily as much as the passenger freight market, so we don't want to lose it. However, we've been looking at airship transportation ourselves for transporting our pieces. You may know that uh, we and, and Boeing in the same way use specially modified large airplanes to transport pieces of our airplanes from site to site, fuselage parts, wings, wings, wing sets, empennage <coughs> parts. And that came to some problems with the A380, just too big. The airplanes we had didn't carry these big pieces. And we said, oh, why not go for a, for a lighter than air transportation system? And we investigated deeply, 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 and we finally found it doesn't work for us for a very simple reason and that makes me very relaxed in terms of competition from from airships a little bit of wind which is blowing for a couple of days in the same direction just makes it impossible to deliver the pieces with the airship they just can't land they can't deliver while the wind is blowing which usually is not a big issue but if you are waiting for pieces to be mounted on an airplane and three days of delay means six airplanes not delivered which is something like a billion of investment, which is not coming into your pockets. No, you don't want to wait for that. You take something which lands reliably within a day, and that's what we do. 
Uh, there is certainly some areas of uh, freight where an airship can be helpful. That's niches from my point of view. And wherever something else works better than what we do, it should be used. We talked about bullet trains earlier. Where they work fine, that's okay. We don't want to, to fly 500 kilometer trips all the time if there is a train connection. We don't want to use our airplanes to fly freight if there is a good lighter than air version of it. But today I don't see it. I don't think that's a real competition, no. Two more, we'll take them quickly. Um, with the pod, are you concerned that people will feel like cargo? What do you think, guys? If you were packaged up in a container and put it, would that make you feel like cargo? Yeah. Uh, there is a risk if we get it wrong, yeah, if we were to do it and really make people, put people in containers, they would probably feel like a piece of cargo. But at the same time, I'm thinking, wouldn't it be nice to sit in a seat and not have to queue up with several hundred people to go through security checkpoints, baggage checks, uh, um, boarding card checks, and all sorts of other checks in an airport? Is, it's a compromise I would make. I would sit in a seat and be quite happily transported onto an aircraft without having to walk anywhere. But then again, I'm getting older, so I would say that. So again, it's very much contextual about who you are, where you are, what your background is. On, on parts of our flight here to Sao Paulo, we didn't feel like freight, but like sheep. And that's not much better. So I would make the same choice. Yeah. Yeah. A comfortable container would be my comfortable choice. Comfortable yeah, luxury containers. That's yeah. what we want. And I tell you, some of the cargo is we, that is transported on aircraft has a very good standard of travel, better than economy class. If you're a racehorse, you get looked after rather well on board. Um, this is an interesting, um, difficult question, this one. How many years ahead is Airbus in terms of technology today? It's a bit difficult to answer that one because ahead of whom? And one thing that's certain about an aircraft is it's not one technology, it is a set. In some areas, I think we can quite comfortably say we are ahead of the game. Boeing and Embraer and others will say in some areas they're ahead of the game. It all depends on which technology, which area. One thing is for certain, and in terms of everything to do with information technology, electronics, software, video uh, things linked to the gaming industry and domestic market, we are way behind. As Greg alluded no, to no, earlier. Not behind Boeing and Embraer, no, but behind the industry. Way Who's behind the industry. It? Yeah, other industries are ahead. When I started, uh, when I, was, I ceased to be a student and I had to earn a living, uh, I joined a military company. And at that point, back in long time ago, in the 80s, 1980s, it was actually the defense industry that was leading technology in general, in terms of materials, in terms of manufacturing, in terms of electronics. The most high-powered processors and memory on the market were for military purposes. Now, the technology you've got in an Xbox or a PlayStation or a uh, home TV far exceeds what most military would have considered those years ago. A couple of uh, a year or so back, just for uh, an experiment, we bought a number of parrot drones. You know what a parrot drone is? Anybody seen a parrot? When I started my career in the military, that would have been classified. It would have been classified technology. So now we're in a situation where some things in our industry, we are, the, each manufacturer will make a claim to being in the lead. But as an industry collectively, it is clear that we are becoming increasingly further and further behind what other people can do. And that is a concern, and that is a concern which has been raised by our uh, previous CEO and current CEO of Airbus Group. It says, as an industry, this is just not about Airbus or Embraer or Boeing or Bombardier or ETR, as an industry, we are lagging behind. We are unable to harness those technologies which are brought for other parts of, of the society for other reasons. We are unable to bring them on board. And that's just something we're going to have to resolve. Yeah. Where we are behind, we have to accelerate. We have to find ways of coexistence with the ones who are up front. 
And where we are really good, we may want to change things, uh, to, to, sorry, to share things with the ones who are not so good. We talked about managing complexity. We are really good on this. Uh, some people ask us to help them on, on managing complex things. We were thinking about having a consultancy branch where we just use our capability of managing complex projects to help other industries. Well, business, not necessarily industry. And that's another way of dealing with what we got. Exchanging what we can do really good with taking on board what others can do really good. And that's the way we, we try to, to think about these days as well. Okay. Should we I think we're going to leave it with that? A close, and uh, you've been very patient with us this afternoon. We're talking to the audience immediately in front of us, but we'd like to say a very, very big thank you to all those people who registered online, stayed online, and contributed online. We appreciate it very much. We hope you found it enjoyable and informative. And thanks to the guys here in the room again. We hope to see you in the week. Hope you bring your friends. If it's only for a, a chat, a discussion on any topic you want, that's great. We're not going to bite and jump at you. Come and talk to us. And if you want to come to the workshops, we'd love to see you. We're going to have a good time with or without you. Yeah. And, and just one last remark I was asked to do. Uh, please all sign the, the sheets you, you got before you leave. Um, there is something about the uh, rights to use photographs, but that's not the big issue. But it's also the entry point for the further activities and for participating in activities after the workshop. You can get material and stuff. So please sign it and leave it at the, at the desk. Yeah. We have one more critical thing. Bracelets. If you have a bracelet, and you should have a bracelet coming through the door, it does entitle you to come to the opening little ceremony tomorrow. And when I was a student, a student, the most important thing is what I'll say next. It gets you a free drink. OK? So. OK, guys. Love to see you again. Thanks for listening. <laughs>